Okay. Wow. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for getting up in the morning. Um, <laughs> hello? Okay. Uh, so I'm John Schull. Uh, I have two cool titles. Um, I am research scientist in magic. <coughs> Do this? Yeah. All right. Yay. I have two titles um, and two voices. Um, research scientist in magic, that's, as you probably know, our IP Center for Media Arts, Games, Interaction, and Creativity. Um, and I am founder of Enable, uh, the story I will focus on today. Um, our friends at Red Hat actually did a movie, which has ruined my presentation because it does a good job of telling our story. So I thought I would pay tribute to them even though it didn't occur to me I should plug in audio, but I think it will play all right, and it's short, so we'll start with that if we can. I like to say, we make children smile, we make parents weep, and we make nerds rejoice. And any of those is actually a real bad honor, but to be able to do all three all at once, which is what usually happens, um, is huge. So I was born without self-consciousness with a, a hand like this, and my dad and I designed this thing, and he uses a 3D printer, and he goes boom, boom, and everyone leaps to their feet, and they give him a standing ovation. Our goal is to totally democratize the process so that <coughs> anybody can see and can buy an appropriate device and get access to the information and the design files and make themselves uh, an assistant mechanical device. Our mission here is to make these designs available to anyone, anywhere. To provide access, not to protect treasure. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine new designs being developed and delivered to the marketplace in a matter of weeks or months. Good at the old way. Being able to share um, and build on each other's ideas um, is, a, is a whole new world. What we're trying to do is we're trying to almost like fast pace what you would originally do with research and development. So you have one idea here, um, and you have another idea here, and you have someone who can help you make that idea either happen or even better. One set of designs all came together with uh, a project where we built an arm for a, um, a child in Mexico, starting from his existing prosthesis that was given to us in September we incorporated in all of the test centers that have been designed for the past two months. And they got there too and built in time for for Christmas. And that was all possible because of the technologies and the philosophies that allow good ideas to go around the world at the speed of light. So that's applause for Red Hat that did such a great job on the video. I have to say that's the first of, at this point, about uh, four or five videos comparable length. They have a longer version of this, comparable quality. They just tell this story. This has become something of a, uh, an international movement, and I want to tell you about some particular aspects of this for two reasons. I think it's one of the best stories ever, um, and we need you. And I think there are all sorts of interesting opportunities, um, both for education as well as for open source development. So one of the things, so I'll, I'll give you the creation note, because I like to, and it's actually my major contribution here, was just um, kicking this thing off and then running as fast as I could to keep up with the snowball. Uh, two and a half years ago, I saw a YouTube video in which a South African carpenter 
reported that after a shop accident where he accidentally cut the fingers off one hand, he was shocked to learn that partial hand prostheses are incredibly expensive and hard to come by. And he did what you and I would do, which is he uh, Googled his way to a Washington State puppet maker who had made a huge mechanical hand that was controlled by pulling strings connected to the mechanical fingers as a puppet for a B-movie. Uh, and they spent a year collaborating, and they came up with a simple mechanical hand. And he mentioned in this video that he discovered that this hand would not only be useful for people like him, but for children who are born with surprising frequency, one in 2,000 kids, born with some kind of an upper limb abnormality, some of them with the equivalent of having no fingers but having a palm, and uh, that he was putting the design on the internet. And this gave me an idea, and I engaged in a quick hack. Um, I made a Google map mashup, and I put a comment on the YouTube video. Now, you guys know that YouTube video comments are the most demoralizing literary genre in the history <laughs> of human literature, and yet, in this case, there were a number that said, what this guy, the carpenter, is doing is great. I would do that. So I added my own comment that said, if you have a 3D printer and you want to help, or if you know someone who needs a hand, put yourself on this map. And within 60 days, there were 70 pins on the map, and people started calling me saying, okay, now what do we do? And of course, I had no idea. So we created a Google Plus community, and it's been growing, and that's sort of how it all happened. I, I like to say, I was dodging the preparation of a course when I made this mashup and put this, this thing. It's sort of like being pregnant. You know, 40 minutes of self-indulgence, and next thing you know, you're responsible for all these children. Uh, and so here we are. Now, among the interesting features of this story is the explosion of design work that's being done in a truly open source fashion by everyone from nine-year-old kids to some of the best engineers um, in the world, uh, and people in between, like, for example, the famous Peregrine Hawthorne, who you saw in the video, who is visiting because he's, uh, he's gonna start college here in the region. Um, any day now. And he's wearing actually the Talon hand, which he has been designing with his dad, who you saw in the video. And he's one of our um, leading critics of all of our designs. And so it's become a really interesting um, uh, collaborative community. Uh, this is the original, I'm pointing at my screen, which you can't see. That picture to the right is the original plus one robo hand snap together design. Uh, crude, but you can see the basic mechanism is apparent there. There are two components, one that fits here, one that fits here. When you bend the wrist, the strings that, con that connect them are pulled, and that causes the fingers, as my trusty assistant will demonstrate yet again, to contract. When you bend your wrist, you make a fist as I like to say to little kids and grown-ups alike. Um, within months, a university professor from Nebraska designed the Cyborg Beast, the name for which was proposed by his son, and it has become one of our classics. You can see it's got, it's got better lines, but you can also see that it has a fair amount of hardware. Um, but in fact, a variety of designs proliferated, including the Talon Hand, the cyborg beast, as I mentioned, and in some great digital gene pool, they started to produce hybrids like, for example, the Talon Beast, which combines some of the features of both. Um, so these designs are coming, however, not just from university professors who do the cyborg beast, French teachers who made the Talon Hand, um, but also this one made by Greg Dennison, who's an HVAC, an air conditioner installer, who learned how to do 3D printing and design from another dad who learned how to do 3D printing and design to make a hand for his son. This kid is named Luke Dennison, and Luke and his dad together realized that in order to hold the things that really matter in life, it would be really helpful to have a hand with two thumbs. See that? 
So this is the Luke hand, and this kid is now known around the world as Cool Hand Luke. <laughs> um, at, a, at a conference uh, in September, last September, at Johns Hopkins, Luke was walking around with a napkin, and he ran up and he said, I've designed a new hand. I, it's called the V2V design. And he had some diagram that I'm still not sure I understood. I said, why are you calling that? He said, because it sounds really cool. <laughs> um, but indeed, they did eventually make a clam-shaped, I guess that's the V, uh, a clam-shaped hand, which has an even better grip. And that's sort of one of, one of the examples of recipient-based design. Um, here's another one, Tully, his arm ends here. And while we were telling him all about how we were building an arm that would work the way our hands do, he said, wait a minute, I'll just put this on my arm which ends here. So that was one innovation, and indeed, that's, that's what he wears. And when asked what color he wants his hand, he said, could it glow in the dark? <laughs> Good idea, right? So that's the Tully hand. He's a double innovator. This is Derek, who was mentioned earlier. When I was explaining to Derek that we were trying to develop this arm and that we needed a test pilot, <coughs> and that that means that nothing would work, but he would need him to tell us about it, uh, he picked up two of these prototypes, he put them end to end, and he said, could my arm be this long? So the Derek arm allows him to pick things up off the floor and reach higher shelves than the rest of his um, classmates, and he's the coolest kid in the class. Um, we also have three-year-old marketing geniuses. This kid received a orange and red hand uh, for Christmas in Hawaii. And while he may have been born without fingers, he was born with one of the best smiles in human history. And they caught him at a moment when he said, look, I got an Iron Man hand. Um, within weeks, our community was churning out Iron Man hands, Wolverine hands, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle hands. And as a matter of fact, this poor kid walked out of a movie theater to be greeted by a bunch of Star Wars clone warrior <laughs> impersonators. This is a, a whole subculture I'm not aware of, but they had produced a Star Wars themed Star Wars themed arm. So this whole thing is sort of getting out of hand. Getting <laughs> out. Um, but it's not just uh, the, the community and it's not just the functionality, it's really about the way this changes the relationship of the individual recipient to their body and the way it changes the relationship of the individual recipient to their environment. This, is, this particular kid is holding up his hand and, it, and uh, the video is a little long, but he does a really great job of saying, I'm born with a funny hand, I you know, gotta do special things to pull things. But then he, he, he just articulated something that we've We've heard a lot, but never quite as well as, as he says it. He says, he says, you know, now this is six weeks before he's gotten the device. He says, I'm counting the days until Christmas when I'm gonna get my new hand. But you know, he says, I have bad dreams. And in these dreams, monsters are coming after me. And it's scary, but now I say, <coughs> you don't scare me, because I have two hands. And this is six weeks before he's gotten the device. Parents tell us that their kids are more confident, their kids are treated with envy <laughs> by other kids. We had a mother um, write in saying, I was sort of skeptical because, you know, as Peregrine will tell you, you can do almost everything with uh, missing fingers. And kids who are born with this don't even realize there's a problem until they get older and it becomes awkward with their peers. So I was always a little skeptical about it, but, but Billy wanted this and we were in the park the day after and not for the first time, a kid came up and said, how come your hand is funny? And Billy said, I have a special hand and if you want, I'll show you my new special robot hand. And by the time they were done playing in the park, the other kid said, you are so lucky. So it really just sort of changes the social dynamic in a really interesting way. But it's a meta-social <coughs> dynamic as well because Nathaniel's hand was made by these girls in a Catholic high school who learned about open source technology and learned about 3D printing. <coughs> and if you look at their faces, <laughs> if you look at their, hello,
if you look at their faces, you can see that they haven't just learned about technology, they've also learned about what technology is good for and what it is to be involved in this kind of activity. Those girls really Good thinking. Well, the trick is, I will do that, but I think it'll pop up anyway, but we'll find you out. It's <laughs> we shall see. All right. Okay. Um, and it's, so there are about 40 classrooms around the country that have taken this on now. And then there are Boy Scout groups that have taken this on. And here you see a, a group in Baltimore, um, which has met about, I don't know, a dozen times now. They get to together for a weekend hand of Palooza, in which they receive hands that are printed by all of our volunteers, and uh, they assemble them in sort of a great big assembly party. And in this, in the case of the event where these pictures were taken, the hands were then shipped to a hospital in northern Israel where they were ex evaluating them for use with Israeli children and with Syrian conflict victims who were smuggled across the border by the uh, Israeli army because they needed help. And about a month ago, we actually heard about their first case of a kid who had um, lost his hand while, sorry, thank you lost his hand while protecting his mother. And they said we gave him an enabled arm and within a week he was on his motorbike riding home. Now we're not <laughs> totally sanguine about that, all aspects of that story, but the point is it's become a multinational, multi-religious, I said Boy Scouts, uh, multi-gender. I said Boy Scouts, but it included Girl Scouts. It included Catholic Boy Scouts, Jewish Boy Scouts, Islamic Boy Scouts, and Frontier Scouts, which I think is the name for the other Girl Scouting group. And the next time we do this kind of thing at the next level, we hope to have these kids teamed up with Scouts who are, after all, positioned all over the world in order to collaborate and to do this kind of thing together. So it's a thing. <laughs> and I'm actually most proud of the fact that I sort of nailed it when I put up that initial Google map, I said, this is, and this was a lie, but it was, it was a good minimally viable project, right? It was, a, it was a prototype. I said, it is a global volunteer assistive technology network built on an infrastructure of electronic communications, 3D printing, and goodwill. And if you put those three things together, and I think it needs all three, at this point, I can say we have proven that, as, as you all um, have known for quite some time, that there are thousands, probably tens to hundreds of thousands of people who are ready, willing, and able to donate time and expertise in order to help other people uh, because it's just the coolest thing ever and because it makes a really big difference. So this is that conference at Johns Hopkins um, where and there you can see Peregrine and his dad, as well as Greg Dennison and Luke, as well as a prosthetics manufacturer and a trauma surgeon who's coming back within weeks from his voluntary tour of duty in Africa. He's a trauma surgeon who develops brain-controlled, super-duper prosthetic arms, um, and he's become a big supporter of ours. That conference turns out to have been a real turning point in the prosthetics industry. We brought together prosthetists as well as printer makers, as well as parents, as well as children, as well as enable volunteers and media, and we taught them all how to do and how to download the files that we were making freely available. Those constituencies had never been in the same room together and they learned a huge amount from each other and everyone said it was the coolest thing ever. And I'm here to tell you that we're doing it again on October 24th in Seattle, Washington, um, which is also going to include the just announced Enable Education Exchange. The 30-some classrooms that have adopted this as a uh, STEM and STEAM learning project, along with another 50 schools, classrooms, and Edutopia type organizations that are interested in this, are now going to begin weekly online hangouts that we're gonna organize and start contributing their course material into an online repository. And we're going to start trying to make it possible for 
mere mortal educators, not just the heroes like you who will get up early in the morning and figure out how to do everything, make it easier for classes to adopt what is already becoming one of the go-to STEM, STEAM, and service learning technology projects um, uh, around. Uh, we are looking for sponsorships, corporate and academic sponsorships, and we're looking for other um, uh, offers of support and participation. <coughs> Our operators are waiting for your call. The point is, it's become a pretty complicated ecology here. Um, there is now not only a community, these numbers are not quite up to date, of 5,800 volunteers um, and three staff, and may I say three staff for 5,800 volunteers is a problem that won't be solved by having more volunteers. So we are seeking to raise money um, in order to bring a few more staff on hand, but it continues. If you want to get on the inside and just see this in action, join our Google Plus community. Uh, you can see here that when I made this slide, we had 2002 members. It wasn't that long ago. It was less than a year ago. Now we're up to 5,800. Um, it's a really interesting place. Um, uh, you're familiar with this kind of thing, but somehow the Google Plus social environment with the pictures and the videos and the stories from all of these diverse contributors to the community make it just a fascinating and visually interesting online community. And it's truly an open source community. We are documenting um, as much as we can, but as you know, we always need help documenting the designs, creating the designs, and trying to understand where we fit within the general open source ecology. It seems to me that um, we sort of won the open trifecta here, right? We're doing open source, but we're also open in the sense of transparent. Uh, everything that we do is, uh, is exposed to the world. And by the way, um, I'm about to argue that it's a really interesting laboratory for studying the kind of thing that we all in this room are fascinated with, um, namely an open community. Um, but in fact, there's some interesting theoretical and legal work still to be done. Our uh, members are using open source licenses and Creative Commons licenses, but the dirty little not so secret is that hardware is different from software. And so licenses created for software and for documents don't probably really protect um, hardware as one would hope. Uh, just to give you one example, it's not at all clear that there's any license that's in common use today which will prevent you from taking a novel design of an object scanning the object, not using the design files, and then rebuilding those parts from the mesh that the scan produced, <coughs> and that escapes the licenses. So we are working with a, uh, uh, a law firm, which, and our liaison there is Mark Radcliffe to help write the GPL 3.0, and we're just now initiating a project to try to develop open source hardware licenses that will work for us and perhaps for the hardware community modeled on the Creative Commons framework. And we are not experts at this, so some of you will understand these issues and be able to help us pull together the right people to figure out whether, for example, the same set of options that Creative Commons offers are the same set of the right options for us to offer to designers of our kinds of devices. <coughs> I want to take a few minutes and just say to all of you software types, that there are some really interesting opportunities. This evolutionary tree here um, was handcrafted by moi. Um, it took a long time, and it's frankly terribly up to date. If it were to be extended to the, out of date is what I meant to say. If it were to be extended to the present, roughly speaking, it would reach to that corner, and I'm gonna guess the middle of the room. The design proliferation has continued, and this visual diagram, which you're familiar with in, in the uh, open source software world, turned out to be really useful. There are designs knocking about. It's not like everyone is using GitHub for this. We have Thingiverse, we have Umagine, we have Cubify, et cetera, et cetera. And it gets very hard for someone who gets a design to know where it stands in the, in the evolutionary tree. 
and whether it's the latest version, and for that matter, whether it's been superseded by some other interesting version. Now, uh, if you look at the bottom right, you can see that Thingiverse, which is the most common of these repositories, has a remix from tag associated with all of the designs that are available there. And you guys will recognize that if I have a node and a graph and I know the parent of that node, I can reconstruct the entire graph. Here is a really cool, real-time, dynamic visualization and data scraping opportunity for someone who wants to pull that information together and turn this not only into a map, but also a user interface for finding your way to the appropriate design and documentation so that before you invest what will be 20 hours of your time, print your time and your time, in making one of these devices, <coughs> um, you're sure you're making the one you want to make or you're sure that there's an opportunity for you to make a new one, which is to say that some of you, how many of you do 3D design? All right, not so few. Okay, well, some of those should immediately join the Enable community because there's plenty of opportunity. Um, so the community, there you go, has, as I have said several times, because I can't get over it, just continued to grow like hotcakes. Uh, there are, any day now, 6,000 members, and each of them probably has, I'm guessing here, I don't know, new opportunities to do analytics on our community, um, 30,000 posts. Each post with a picture, with a comment, uh, with, a, with a description, and then with a thread of comments on it. And Google Plus gives you no particular way of navigating that. It is a haystack of haystack of needles. Um, here's an idea. If you think about it, each row in that graph represents one person from the moment they came on board all the way up to the present time. If every moment of their activity produced a little pixel under the curve, then this texture here would actually be a guide to activity day by day by day for the entire population. Furthermore, if you were to mouse over the relevant pixel, you might get a preview of what you could read if you clicked on the pixel and actually drilled down into there. If you had some clever color coding, you could begin to see that there were groups who were involved in certain conversations, and it would become a really interesting part and a really interesting navigational tool for exploiting what is Frankly, I happen to believe a sort of historic petri dish of interesting and evolving open source ideas, prosthetic ideas, social ideas, etc. Similarly, you could use the same data for social network analysis, which is just the obvious thing to do, and yet hasn't been done because Google hasn't exposed the API for private communities, which is a tragedy but true. I wrote a splinter script in Python, which will go and click on every damn post, read the data off the screen, and could in principle capture it all and then do a visualization like this. But my days of being able to actually complete a project like that seem to have passed. Um, so I'm calling out to you all and I will point out that in addition to the usual rat's nest of social network analyses, there are some really interesting ideas here. Um, this one, there you go. This is from uh, 3D.js, and that guy whose name I forgot produced this wonderful visualization, which shows, for example, every person and every person, and if they're part of the same node, they become a dot, and then it automatically and dynamically sorts the rows and columns so that the columns, um, the patterns, and the clumps jump out at you. This would be really useful if, which he didn't do, again, you could click and say, what is this cluster? What are they talking about? Okay, I want to drill down into that. Software engineering, social engineering, information engineering, big opportunities. We don't have people flocking, <laughs> a little joke there, flocking to our community 
in order to solve those kinds of problems. But as you can see, those are great problems, and they will really enhance the more general effort. Here's one more bit of bait I want to dangle in front of this particular community. Um, like everyone and their brother, we too are thinking about badging and how it might end gamification, although I, I, I would like to be able to call this recognition. Because it, it seems to me it's not just about giving somebody a gold star. When uh, you probably understand this, but we're still thinking it through. When you see a military person or a scout with a bunch of badges on his chest, you basically see the resume right there. You know what particular topics this person would be a good um, helper and collaborator on. In Google+, Plus, which happens to be, for the moment, where we live, we've got, uh, we ha everyone has a round avatar next to them whenever they do anything. So we propose that we could imagine that around the edge of the circle, the circular avatar, would be little clock positions, and each position would represent a different part, a different kind of achievement. And as you can see, this guy seems to have invested heavily in two particular kinds of activities, and he's earned, in this fictional example, he's earned three levels in both of them. And our idea is that someone Someone could write a simple program that would download somebody's avatar, add a ring when they acquired a, um, a merit badge, and invite them or automatically update their avatar to show it. There's one other piece of the puzzle which is sort of interesting because as per, as per the fact that we don't have the staff to manage this kind of thing or to develop the software in full, We'd like to allow the community to build this thing out. And so the half-baked idea that I will share with you is that, in fact, the one o'clock position on the clock has to do with introducing yourself to the community. The, let's say, minute six on the clock has to do with welcoming a member of the community. Um, the second ring of minute five would have to do with updating your avatar because you've got a medal for um, introducing yourself to the community. Down near the bottom, or in this case, I say, let's say in, at minute uh, 35, uh, would be a series of badges for <laughs> things like proposing a new badge, like getting 20 or more votes, a majority of which are in favor of adopting the badge, for actually identifying the validation criteria for the badge, and I would like to think that some five or six notions like that would be su sufficient to create a machine that would then encourage and allow the community to start inventing and ratifying all of their own merit badges on their own. Because in fact, one of the biggest challenges we have, and I know you all are quite familiar with this problem, is, you know the expression, herding cats, all right? But you think that herding cats is hard, try putting cats in charge of the herding, right? We have a new Enable Community Foundation whose mission, one of whose missions is carefully described as helping the community self-organize, right? The volunteerism of what you and we do is really an important part of the miracle of what we're doing. Um, so we don't wanna suck the life of that out of that, however, if I may, there are a thousand people waiting for enabled hands this, at this time. We have 5,800 volunteers and we haven't made it easy enough, rewarding enough, or straightforward enough for enough of them to get organized and begin churning these things out. So there's a huge opportunity for software development to facilitate the self-organization of the community. And while it is true, I'm happy to say, that we just got a $600,000 grant from google.org to develop and improve our processes as well as our devices. We haven't found the right people and you know that money is not necessarily uh, going to allow us to develop this kind of software. So we're still trying to figure that out, work out the governance and the accountability for this. But again, we're new to this, right? I mean, I sort of have uh, embrace the open source philosophy, but, but we are doing, we're not only open sourcing software, 
we're open sourcing hardware, and we're open sourcing in a way that I think goes beyond most of the ventures that you're familiar with. We're open sourcing the, the time and the compassion of a global community that is eager to change the world um, using this network, this recipe of internet communication technologies, 3D design, and goodwill. Um, you know, I like to say that the Enable Community Foundation and Enable has got three missions. The first of them is to make sure that inexpensive upper limb devices are available to anyone, anywhere. It's, it's, it seems audacious, but frankly, I think we're on track, and that's gonna happen. Even if we go away, and there's no indication that we're going away, we've demonstrated that you can use this technology to produce inexpensive devices that are substantially better than nothing, <laughs> which is what most children and most of the world's population currently uses for upper limb prosthetics. And we have already begun to disrupt and influence the prosthetics industry, which is um, ambivalent about what we're doing, but recognizes that we've opened up a market which is probably 10 to 100 times larger than the market they have been serving for the last 100 years. Our second mission is to support, and this is gonna be a generic, genericized version of the first mission, to support a global community of humanitarians using emerging technologies, not just 3D design and software, but emerging technologies, um, to innovate new solutions for underserved populations, not just people born with um, upper limb differences, <coughs> but all sorts of upper, all sorts of underserved populations. It's a noble and audacious goal, and I think part of the reason people are so fascinated by what we do is because we've done the proof of concept. We're not done with upper limb uh, prosthetics, and for that matter, we're already expanding from hands to arms, from arms to orthotics, for, for example, people who've got um, hands but have lost control of their fingers so they can now bend and unbend their arms, and that will open and close their fingers. Uh, we had a new hack come out just yesterday, which tickles my fancy, a motorized arm for people who don't have enough of a residual limb to move it mechanically. The motor is a $20 electric screwdriver clamped onto the $20 plastic hand. When the screwdriver activates, it's got a motor, it's got electronics, it's got a battery, and it's available at your local hardware store for $20. When it turns, the hand opens and closes. Um, so we're moving towards motorized um, limbs and we're moving towards other parts of the body as well. But this general notion goes beyond body parts, all right? Heads up displays are, we keep being promised, gonna be ubiquitous any day now. And when they are, everyone in this room is gonna have the skills that can use those <coughs> devices, not just for entertainment or surfing the web, but for example, to produce heads up displays for the blind, reading glasses. They've got a camera, you put a book in front of it, it reads into your ear, so we call them reading glasses. Or subtitles, speech to text for the deaf. Or facial recognition help for the autistic. Or you tell me. The point is, if in five or 10 years, the 3D printed prosthetics problem is a done deal, our community will have moved on to the emerging sweet spot for the next thing. And so the third mission is to figure out what emerging tip of the iceberg, sorry, what iceberg we are the emerging tip of. Uh, which is a really fuzzy and strange sentence, but I think it's, it's accurate. But the point is the economics of this and the ethics and the social organization implied by all of this are really not clear and we have an opportunity to lead the way in exploring it. Now it could be this whole thing is gonna be assimilated com and commercialized, and I will be quite happy to declare victory if cheap commercial devices end up out in the world, but it's also possible that the thing that's most striking about us, the fact that it's a volunteer distributed manufacturing process motivated not by dollars, 
and not merely by the um, self-satisfaction of becoming better at technology, but by the <coughs> human spirit of compassion and collaboration. That is, people talk about open source and they now talk about the sharing economy, which as you know, is actually not so much when they talk about Uber and these other companies, not so much as sharing so much as collaborative consumption, but they do talk about, let's say, collaborative co consumption, they talk about the sharing economy, and my point is right now we seem to be getting a glimpse of a caring economy. And like the open source movement, of which we are a proud part, it's not clear what all of this means in the long run. But if you read the right books, and I recommend these books to you, we're entering an era in which energy is free and robots, probably driven by open source software, are doing all of the heavy lifting, right? In a world like that, what are people for? Well, arguably, people are for using these incredible technologies to better the lives of other people who are not quite on the other side of that, of that Rubicon. That's a possible interpretation over 10 to 30 to 50 years of what this more general movement is all about. And since we have the opportunity of exploring that one too, I think we have the responsibility of exploring that one too. And so I want to urge you all to figure out how to get on board and help us make it better and work better and how to help us do it smarter, building in part on all of the open source and educational savvy that you guys are experts in. Thank you very much. So did I go 15 minutes over or do I, we have time for discussion? Okay, cool. Thoughts? Recommendations? Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you talked a little bit about disruption in the existing um, industries where it has been the high cost. Uh, I heard a story a while ago about someone made a tablet app for helping children communicate using icons that was then um, shut down by the FDA, I think, for making an unlicensed medical device. Uh, have you run into trouble like that? You know, we, we everyone hear that? No, he says, you know, there was this company that made augmentative software for, uh, on a tablet for people with language disorders. They were shut down by the FDA. We've been worried about that a lot. But in truth, I can now report that the FDA has been watching us carefully. And I have a video which I carry with me and will be happy to show anyone in which an FDA official in a moment of weakness at a conference says, you know, everyone is saying that Enable is circumventing FDA regulations here. But the FDA wants to support worthy efforts. And in fact, we have regulations which allow us to create discretionary categories in which our regulation need not apply. And because they are dealing with upper limb, given away for free, therefore not, not warranted, et cetera, um, devices, we think what they're doing is just fine, they're doing just what we want, and no problem. So that's given us a reprieve, but in, the, in truth, our strategy continues to be make sure the horse is way out of the barn before they figure out what the door is and how to close it. And meanwhile, they also are trying to get their regulations right. They notice, by the way, that we are, we're being quite careful and conservative and we're being even more careful about appearing to be careful and conservative. So for example, there is huge need around the world for these upper limb prosthetics, and we get uh, inquiries on an almost weekly basis from some orphanage or United Nations agency or someone saying, we wanna get a 3D printer and we wanna, do, we wanna solve our problem in the refugee camp with this. And we have to tell them a few things which I wanna mention here, which is it's early days for 3D printing. If you get a 3D printer and you want to do this, be prepared to be tinkering. It's a tinkerer's game these days. Now, you know, I know for many of you that's part of the appeal, but for many people who are trying to solve the world's problems, especially in difficult environments, we have to give them that warning and we also have to say, 
that we are actively looking for partners who can take medical responsibility for not congenital kids in upper middle class families who found us so far, but post-traumatic kids in unstable war zones. And so it's a gradual process. But the point is, because we're taking it gradually, because we're, we're being, because you know, sooner or later, some kid is gonna get hit by a car while, while, while riding one of our bikes, and at that point, the FDA is perfectly able to say, you know, that discretionary category needs to be tuned up. So it's, it's a work in progress, but I've tried to sort of sketch the, our stance with regard to it. And yet, let me say, first of all, we got a small grant, small as $100,000, and we had a team of, uh, go to Haiti, uh, got back last week, they're gonna be there all year, to try to figure out what would be a good model for that kind of situation. 50 countries um, around the world, or let me put it this way. This week, the latest of these videos that I'm so proud of came out of Al Jazeera. They did a 10 minute piece about Enable in Brazil. I had nothing to do with anything. I just showed up by surprise. This is happening all over the world with the same kind of ambiguity, even though there are these regulatory questions. So what, the question I wanted to ask is, as a project of a research, particularly in the area of spectrum, um, or digital spectrum, uh, so you mentioned that you want to continue this in other areas and look into augmented um, reality and all you know, things that are better help. So is that something that you're, tr you're currently doing now, or are you focusing on just the enabling community to go there, or right. what is that right So now? the community, the Enable Google Plus community and its affiliated Facebook and websites and so on, is really focused on uh, 3D printed upper limb assistive devices right now. There's a lot to do, and it is in a regulatory sweet spot, so we may as well work all of this out there. The autistic story, the heads-up display story, for that matter, the home genetically engineered nutraceutical story, which I haven't mentioned, but is gonna happen next, I think, um, are just things I, one can see coming on the horizon. And it's quite possible that the aptly named Enable Community Foundation could become the umbrella for a community of such ventures some of which would focus on heads-up displays and autistic spectrum, some of which would focus on other opportunities as well. That has to do with you know, goals two and three. And we're learning a lot as we do goal one. So that's where we're at. Yes? So, uh, I, had, I had seen your, your talk at the summit and I had kind of assumed that the community was more around research and development, but you also touched a little bit on, it's like it sounds like you're also doing manufacturing and distribution. You bet. So what, what tends to be the relationship between you know, the, the maker and the user, and how do you do quality and distribution? What does that actually look really like? It's a really good question, and it's an evolving question. The standard answer, which is the, probably still the most common take, is, uh, so here, here's, here's a case study. So uh, a month ago, not a month ago, about six months ago, we got an email from China. Actually, we got an email from Canada from a Chinese woman whose Chinese sister had heard about us somehow, saying this would be great for our little boy. So the Canadian sister writes to us, and it goes to an email address called enablematcher at gmail.com. That's known as Melina Brown in Alabama, uh, or one of her minions. Her job, is to look at the, is to, is to get information about the patient from the parents and the family using a questionnaire that we have, including some photographs, then to decide which of our existing volunteers would be a good match for that person. As it happened that same week, probably because the same news report was circulating somewhere in China, we had our first Chinese volunteer. So she hooked the two of them up and I gotta say, this doesn't happen very often. Within a week, that kid had a hand. Usually it takes one to six weeks. It can even take months. It's a, it's 
So that's, that's sort of the standard process. But another process is one where <laughs> 3dprint.com last night published an article, which caught me by surprise, saying, enable seeks 1,000 hands by mid-September. Apparently it's true, but it escaped me that we'd put out this call. Uh, but several companies are now offering little goodies and rewards for people who will print those hands. Those will then be shipped to classrooms and scouting troops and parties, assembly parties, including Autodesk University. We're going to be there doing this in December in Las Vegas, um, where they get assembled. And then they get dispatched under that model, ideally, to someone who can then you know, deal with a local population. We're also working with groups like 3D Hubs. 3D Hubs and iMaker has something similar is a network of 17,000 3D printer people who affiliated with this Uber for 3D printing. And they've just put out a call and we have an initial pilot team of 30 people who said, sure, we'll print these for free. So that's another way in which it'll happen. It is you know, distributed, not-for-profit, manufacturing and design comparable story about matching designers and problems and so on, and it's, it's evolving as fast as we can. Yes? Let's say I want to help you. Yeah. Uh, we've got a 3D printing lab in Europe, uh, on universities, and I think it's all of these pieces printed, or we need to assemble it or something like that? Actually, there are opportunities to do it either way. Um, the assembly is sort of like, like a Star Wars Lego project, right? Not impossible, but <coughs> it takes three or four hours. Um, but we do have calls out for uh, unassembled hands because we've got classrooms and scouting troops that do this social thing where they get into it by doing the assembly. So no, you do not have to master the fine art of assembly, although our new designs are going to make assembly easier and easier. And in a few years, they're probably going to be printing place suckers where you don't even have to assemble them. They're just you know, ready to go, minus, maybe minus the strings, maybe not. It's an evolving story. The simplest way, if you really want to start printing and so on, is to send an email to let's get started at enablingthefuture.org. That's probably the ending commercial, right? Let's get started at enablingthefuture.org or go to enablingthefuture.org or the Enable Community Foundation and don't fail to notice that we're looking for volunteers of all stripes, including those who want to um, help sponsor our coming conference. Thank you. I'd love to talk to any of you who want to continue the conversation. Yeah. <laughs>